guys. My name is Fred Henson. I'd like to welcome you to worship here at Four Rivers. If you're at the Lakes Campus, uh, we are coming to you here in Paducah from a completely different location this morning. Uh, thanks to a, uh, I don't know how old, 60-year-old boiler, uh, we are worshiping together over here. And, and boy, I'm having a good time. I don't know about you guys. I'm looking around and seeing people enjoy one another's company. And I know that uh, we as a church in, with the Paducah campus and the Lakes campus, we've said for a long time that those of you at the Lakes campus, you guys seem to be leading the way in relationships and, and care for one another. They really are doing a great job. We learn a lot at the Paducah campus from the Lakes campus in that particular area. And I want you to know, folks in Cover City, we're catching up with you because uh, we are having some really cool relational things happen here in this area. And it's just been a really, really good time for us over the past couple of weeks. We're in a teaching series called The Advent Conspiracy, which you're going to learn more about today. Uh, so if you would, let's pray and then we'll get started. Jesus, we love you. We trust you. We need you. Without you, we have nothing. I ask that today you would help us to see how this can be a very special Christmas season. Although many or all of us have special memories of Christmas, that we could actually create memories this year that will be some of the best, if not the best memories that we have of this season in our lifetime. Father, I pray that you would give us the right attitude, the right heart. You would help us to be flexible as a church and as families and as Christ followers so that we can learn and grow and develop and follow you. In your name we pray. Amen. Yesterday, Stephanie and the boys and I had the all-important family photos made, you know, where you buy the new red shirt, you know, and, and everybody else gets something similar, and you all go to the photographer, and you sit around, and they make you do positions and things that you would never do, like lean in a little further. And I'm like, you know, that, that got me smacked the last time I leaned in. To, you know, she's not going to let lean in. You know, you're all awkward. In one photograph, I was literally, he kept, okay, a little more, a little more, a little more. Yeah, right there. And I, you think I'm happy on the picture, but I'm doing this, you know, the whole time. So... Uh, there were two things in the photograph that I saw when it was done. He, he did a good job, and we put a few of them on Facebook, and somebody said, some, some folks have made some nice comments, but there were a couple of things I did not like about our Christmas family photo. First of all, Stephanie and the kids, they look beautiful. I mean, they look gorgeous. They're just fantastic. But when I looked at myself in the picture, well, I noticed two things that I didn't like. Can you guess? One of them was... The more I would smile, the more I would wrinkle. You know what I mean? Okay, 10 years ago, Stephanie and I moved back to the Paducah area to plant a church, and I lived out the persona of a young church planter. And I got to tell you, if you're going to be a pastor, a young church planter, that's what you ought to be. I mean, that's like, that's, that's the gig right there for pastors. That's the thing to be young church planter. Everybody agree with that? That's a good thing. The problem is, it's been 10 years, and so now I'm a church planter. You see the difference between the two? And the photograph, the photograph, it really made it very clear. You know, you look at the photos of Brad 10 years ago, the photos of Brad now, and there are things there that were not there 10 years ago. There's another thing. There's another thing. And uh, I could have had this one fixed. Um, I could have had this one dealt with, and I have in the past, but when I have this one fixed, people always pick on me about it, so I decided to just go natural this time, and that is, I have gray hair, like I have a lot of gray hair, there was a time when I had gray hairs, you know what I mean, like a couple of them, and they've taken over, they're like a virus, they're just gone everywhere, and I know guys say things like, I don't care what color it changes as long as it doesn't fall out, and that kind of thing, bull, I don't want gray hair, I'm like, no, I, you know, I'm a young church planter, right? Okay, no. Uh, t ten years ago, when I was a young church planter, one of the downsides to my leadership and one of the things that when you, you know, you do hindsight and you look back and you think things like, what could we have done better? One of the things was that I think there were times when we came across as rebellious, you know? Like we were young and hip and cool and new and different and almost like the anti-church. You know what I mean? Like we, in fact, if we could find something that normal churches did, we found a way to do it differently. Like everything. You know what I mean? Everything. We would, we would sit around a table and go, what do Baptists normally do? Okay, let's not do that. You know, 
What do, how, and we, and like everything was, like everything. And I remember an article that was written in the newspaper that, that really hurt me. This was an article that made me so sad, and I thought, this is going to be the end of it all. Uh, my uncle was a, was a pastor in the city for, for 35 or so years, and great man, very good reputation, did a great job as a pastor. And, and the church that he led was a very, you know, very traditional, straightforward Baptist church. And uh, an article was done 10 years ago on Four Rivers as we were getting started, and the title, the heading was something like, I don't remember the exact words, but it was like, not your uncle's church, dot, dot, dot. And I saw that, and I was like, that doesn't that sound rebellious? Doesn't it sound like, like I'm finding some Christian way to give the finger to all churches, you know, and just go, we're different, you know, not like you, you know? Um, well, I said all that to say that there is a downside to rebellion. Okay, is that an understatement? <laughs> there is a downside to rebellion in a major way. And yet, today, believe it or not, in the sermon series that we're presently in, uh, this series was originally called Four Words, and I've rewritten some things and kind of uh, changed some things for myself, but, but we're calling it the Advent Conspiracy. The, the, the second word, last week our word was worship, and this week our word is rebel, okay? And, and I'm saying it now not in its negative connotation like I have in the past at times, but now actually talking about what does it mean to rebel in a good way? What would actually be a rebellion that would be welcomed by God, a rebellion that would be encouraged by God, a rebellion that would be Christ-like? That's a rebellion that we want to talk about as the part of the Advent conspiracy this year, okay? So if you would, open your Bibles. Uh, you can read off the screen with me as well. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Matthew at first as we look at the beginnings of the story of Christmas. Matthew chapter 2, the first few verses say this. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. You heard of King Herod? King Herod's a bad guy. He's, uh, King Herod does a lot of really, really mean things. He harms a lot of people. And the weird thing about King Herod is that King Herod is middle management. King, the king that's a stretch, okay? He, he's the guy that the real king lets call himself king in a certain small part of the kingdom, Okay? We'll find out more about that as time goes on. It says that he was born in Bethlehem in Judea uh, during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, and they were asking a question. Their question was, now if you remember, they go to the palace. They go where they would think a child who's going to be a king would be born. They're at the palace, and they go to the king, and they ask the king this question. Where is the new king? the newborn king of the Jews. We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, this is one of the biggest understatements as you read in Scripture. You could read it, and it really be an understatement. It really is a very powerful passage. It says, King Herod was deeply disturbed. Okay, better translation. King Herod flipped out. Okay? Uh, hissy fit, had a cow... Those, you get this? Okay. King Herod went nuts, uh, and so did everyone else in Jerusalem. That's, that's the passage. You guys, I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus, even by being born, was a rebel. Christ following in its origination was rebellious. A rebellious against the empire. Let me talk to you about this for a second. Any, uh, any Star Wars fans? Lakes Campus, Paducah, Star Wars fans? Okay, you people know what it means to rebel against the empire, don't you? You got that figured out? My oldest son's eight. We've just introduced him to the force recently. He's becoming quite the fan. We're going we're gonna to decorate his bedroom as Star Wars stuff uh, for Christmas. That's something that's going on in our household right now. Uh, that's going to be a blast. Uh, any Trekkies in the room? Lake, Lakes Campus, you get Trekkies? There's like two of you. You guys should sit. They are sitting together right over here. That's good. Any other Trekkie? That's a Trekkie table. You guys Trekkies? I'm sure we have lots of Trekkies at the Lakes Campus too. Uh, you people, you get it too. You get rebellion against the empire and what it means to, to gather together the good and the innocent to fight against the powerful and the evil and the dark. That's basically what's going on. Now, 
I have a story to tell you about a rebellion against the empire that's not from a movie and it's not from the script of a novel. This is a true story. And I'm, I just almost guarantee I'm going to introduce you to some information that you didn't know this morning, some new things. So I, I ask you to just really, really stay with me. I'm going to teach you some things that you'll leave and want to talk about this afternoon, okay? In the time Jesus was born, the local, you know, middle management king over Jerusalem was King Herod. But King Herod answered completely and totally to Caesar. Uh, If you remember your history during that time, the kingdom, the empire was the Roman Empire. And in that day and time, it stretched from modern day India to modern day England. Okay, for those of you who don't memorize the globe, that's big. That's bigger than America, that's bigger than Russia, that's bigger, that's huge. It's a gigantic span of time. They ruled that area by force, might, intimidation, and ultimately the power that was known as Caesar. Now we've seen all the movies, right? You've seen the Russell Crowe movie. You've seen the others about living life during that time, what it meant to be a warrior under Caesar. Caesar got what he wanted. Now, Caesar's just a title. It means king, okay? And there were multiple Caesars. The Caesar who's most well-known, that your, that your professor in college or maybe your reading or literature teacher in high school made you read, was a Shakespeare play called Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar, by far the most famous of the Caesars. Caesar Augustus, his son, actually adopted son, was the Caesar when Jesus was born. That's why in one passage it says that Caesar Augustus decreed that there would be a census, and the census went all around the Roman world. And basically what Caesar was doing, he was measuring up who he had in his kingdom to find out who he needed to squash so that he did not lose power. Caesar Augustus was a unique guy. He was the adopted son of a real Caesar, which meant that genetically he wasn't a Caesar. In that sense, many would say that he had the uh, disease we we sometimes call little man syndrome. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? He just, he tried to make up for anything that he might have been lacking and that he was an adopted son of a Caesar, okay? Caesar Augustus. Uh, his, his, uh, he was the first one, the first Caesar, to decree that all Caesars were a god. In fact, in other words, we're not king, we're not president, we're not a ruler, we are a lord. And under Caesar Augustus, he actually began by saying that, that Julius Caesar was a god. Now think about how this works. He began by saying Julius Caesar is a god, and he built temples, and he built Uh, Lots of different things that people would use to worship. They even instated a priesthood of the Caesar. And so now if he is the son of a Caesar who was God and now he's Caesar, what does that make him? The son of God. There's another thing you should know about during that time. There's a writer by the name of Virgil. Uh, He's very well known in Greek and Roman mythology and different things. He lived up until about 20 years before Jesus was born. And Virgil was a historian, very intriguing guy. Virgil, in some of his plays and literature... He predicted that there would be, get this, an infant born in the Roman Empire who would bring God and man together. Now, the Old Testament speaks of that, and we as Christians, we believe that that was Jesus, right? But all throughout that time period, you have to realize that it wasn't just the Jews who were looking for the baby. That's why men from the East come to find the one who was being born. People were looking for the folklore, the baby who would be born, king of the Jews, who would rule over all. And Caesar had an idea. Caesar Augustus realized, wait a second, people are looking for a baby that will be born, that will reign in authority, that will rule between God and man. And he devised a plan. If my dad was God, and if I'm now in his seat, And if I'm born in the time period the baby had to be born in, wait wait a minute, I'm that baby. That's me. The one who the Jews were looking for, the one who the world was looking for, Caesar says, that's me. And in fact, for instance, uh, one great historian, I love this guy's name. I'm going to give it to you just to 
just to tell you his name, it, it's Ethelbert Stauffer. Now, I tell you that name for two reasons. One, I don't, I don't want you to think I'm making this up. Two, I want to tell you not to name your child Ethelbert. Uh, Ethel, I think we could pull that off, right? Bert, we could probably work with that. But you take Ethel, you take Bert, you put it together. Now you got Ethelbert. I'm just telling you, your child's going to get picked on so much that they will become a Roman history scholar. Be all they'll ever want to do, okay? Uh, Ethelbert, I don't know his story, but Ethelbert focused his time on his studies, and he focused specifically on uh, coinage in the Roman time period. He looked for what the words on the coins said about Caesar. Now, do you remember a story with Jesus and a coin? Remember this story? People came to Jesus, and they said, should we pay our taxes? And Jesus points out that on the coin, what, what is on it? Do you remember? Caesar. And it says something on the coin. We don't know what it says, but Jesus says, whose picture is on it? And they say Caesar. And Jesus says, we'll give unto Caesar what Caesar's. In other words, this is his money. He owns this. His face is on it, right? Okay, well, listen to the, some of the things that were written on coins during the Roman Empire about Caesar Augustus. Salvation is to be found in none other save Augustus. There is no other name given to men in which they can be saved than Augustus. How about this? Caesar is what? Lord. In fact, Caesar Augustus built a holiday around his birth. And they called it the 12 days of Advent. Leading up to the birth of the child Augustus. His, his given name was Octavian. Okay? I tell you all this because I want you to realize that when Jesus was born of a virgin and the men from the east came looking for him and they went to King Herod and they said, where is the baby that's been born? This was not good news for Herod, nor was this good news for Caesar, which is why it doesn't take long for the entire Roman Empire to be turned on its head by the birth of a peasant infant in a manger you see what I'm saying? In Bethlehem. King Herod was so afraid that he sent out the decree that all boys, two years old and under, born in that time period and in that range would be slaughtered. If you read on through the second chapter of Matthew, you find that Mary and Joseph hear from God that they should flee. They take baby Jesus and they go into Egypt to get away from the fact that Herod and Caesar want him dead. He lives through it. He comes back. He grows up. And then as an adult, he starts a ministry. He develops the ministry. He has followers. He heals the sick. He makes disciples. And then at the point that he's in his early 30s, a conspiracy between the Jewish leaders who hated what he was doing to their religion and the Roman government who hated the thought that he might overthrow them decided to kill him. He dies on a cross. He rises on the third day. And then the book of Acts tells us about the early Christian movement and I, you remember what it said on the coin about Caesar? Listen to what Simon Peter said in Acts chapter 4 about Jesus. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. You have to understand that when the early Christians said those things about Jesus, they weren't just saying them about Jesus. They were saying... Jesus is Lord, Caesar is not. Jesus is the Son of God, Caesar is not. Jesus is the mediator between heaven and earth. Jesus is the Messiah, Caesar is not. A large percentage of the early Christian movement were martyred. That means they were slaughtered for their faith. They, they were not killed because they, they preached Jesus. It was not what they believed that caused their death. It was what they would not do. It wasn't what they did. It was what they said they wouldn't do. Now, there were thousands of gods. Everybody worshipped different gods. Saying Jesus is God doesn't hurt anybody's feelings. Saying Jesus is God above Caesar is worthy of death. And many of them died. We have other Caesars like Domitian and Nero that we read about in the 2nd century AD who did things like hanging Christians on a spike and lighting their body aflame so that they could light the streets at night with anyone who said that their God was bigger than Caesar. See the kind of torture and 
terror that was used to fight against them. Still, in the midst of that, Christianity grew. And it didn't grow like we get excited. Like we get excited, hey, there were two new families on Sunday morning. Awesome. It grew rapidly from a meager few thousand people in the beginning to millions and millions of Roman citizens in less than 100 years. Before you know it, one of the Caesars becomes a Christ follower and turns the Roman Empire into a Christian nation from his perspective. This is an all-out spiritual rebellion against the empire that happened in the early church. And I tell you this story because I want to ask you to be a part of a rebellion today. Now, before you go anywhere, you're thinking, "Uh uh-oh, did I come to the wrong church? No. This is not a rebellion about the government. It's not a rebellion rebellion about America at all. I'm not talking about it in any way. Just be clear, okay? I'm talking about an, an empire that we have created as individuals. A culture, you might say, that revolves around our Christmas experience. An empire of consumerism. An empire of materialism and an empire of overspending at a time when we come together to celebrate the birth of the greatest gift ever so many people find themselves in the middle of January with an overwhelming amount of debt with an emptiness inside that feels like something was missing this year from Christmas and with relationships that have been given love simply through dollar signs And I'm not, by the way, I'm not to Scrooge. I'm not the anti-Christmas guy. I have two Christmas trees, have every plan to light up the outside of my house. I love to put on a Santa Claus hat and act like a goofball at the Christmas dance. Okay, I I don't, this is not a Scrooge sermon. It's not an anti-Santa Claus sermon. I'm not saying that at all. I'm simply saying that, do you think it's possible that sometimes we miss something? That, That what is designed to be a celebration of Advent, the beginning of leading up to the birth of the God-man who came to mediate between us and God. Sometimes what started out with, you know, a few, a few wise men and a manger ends up, you and I, freaked out at the mall with three credit cards, trying to make sure everybody's happy with everything we get them, you know? Somewhere in between the two, something's lost. That's the empire that I'm asking you to consider conspiring against this year. I'm not asking you to conspire about it in anybody else's life. I'm not asking you to have an opinion about how somebody else does Christmas in their home. I'm not asking you to go door to door and tell people to take down their tree. Do not do that. And if you do that, don't tell them you go to church here. (laughs) You know, okay, I'm asking you in your home to say, what if I, in my house, was to con- what if I in my home were to conspire against my own materialism, against my own consumerism? What if I in my house were to do a few things? Now you're going to hear these points over and over because this is the kind of the point of the Advent conspiracy. Last week we talked about worshiping more, okay? Letting this experience, Christmas, be a time of worship. When 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 the 25th and the 26th of this month roll around. My encouragement is that you would be able to sit back and go, I worship Jesus this month. Now, we're having a worship gathering tonight just for that. We're going to celebrate and party, boogie down, and all that fun stuff. At, at, you know, at the dance, for those of you at the Lakes Campus, you'll be seeing this, and the dance was last week, and I know you had lots of fun, okay? We're going to be doing all kinds of stuff like that. We're going to do that to celebrate Christmas, but I'm not saying attend more gatherings, I'm saying that you in your home, whether you live alone, whether you're married with no kids, or if you have a big family, I'm asking you to consider worshiping this season. Secondly, kind of the main point for today, is to spend less. Not not spend nothing. I'm not saying spend nothing. I'm saying spend less. Do you know that half of Americans buy Christmas on on credit? Okay, nothing wrong with credit. I'm not anti-credit. I use credit card. I'm not... But half of Christians, I'm sorry, half of people in America buy Christmas on credit. And half of those who buy it on credit don't have it paid off next Christmas. Half of half, which is 25% of the American culture, buy Christmas on credit. And by the time next Christmas rolls around, haven't been able to pay off the debt by that time. Now, that's not a slam. I'm not saying, you know, you bad money manager. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I don't think 
that the value of love shown through what was in the box is worth the indebtedness that you have to have for it. And my encouragement to you is that you might actually live a more free year if you decided to spend less. It's mostly about ego anyway, isn't it? We buy the $40 gift because we know that person's going to get us a $40 gift. And so we feel like if they're going to get us a $40 gift, we have to get them a $40 gift because that's only fair. We want them to think good of us, so we give them a $40 gift knowing they're going to give us a $40 gift. I bet the number of people who would love to go, you keep your $40, i will keep my $40. I bet that number would go way up if people would talk about it, if people were just honest about it. Uh, I think ego is such a huge issue for us. I know in my life... You know, we buy for lots of people. We have big family on both sides, and we're very close to our families. And we find ourselves occasionally, you know, sit, sitting there going, okay, what are we going to get them? You know, I don't know. How much did we spend? I don't know. Anybody asked these questions before? You know, okay, how much did we spend last year? Okay, I don't remember. Okay, well, then let's just set a, we do this. We say, this is the number we're going to spend on everybody. Okay, what we're doing this year is we're, we're, we're working toward cutting $10 out of everybody. We're going to spend less. Okay, if it was forty dollars on everybody, it's going to be thirty dollars on everybody. If it was thirty, it's going to be twenty. If it was twenty, it's going to. See what I'm saying? That's what we're doing. I don't know what you'll need to do. It may be you're sitting there and you go, "Time out, Brad. My family, we did this twenty years ago. We have a really cool attitude about giving at Christmas, and I don't think we need to spend less. I think we can afford what we're doing, and it's great." And I would say to you, "Awesome." You are the example for the rest of us. Maybe I'm not talking to you, but for many of us in this room. Christmas becomes a time when we spend so much more than we really need to. And we put ourselves into a bondage of January, February, March, April, where we're looking back and going, praise Jesus was born. You know, ha, ah, Visa card's coming again. You know, and I'm just asking you not to put yourself in that place. How in the world do we worship more if we're going to spend less? Well, the third point then would be, and this is a tricky one, you ready? Give more. You're thinking, I knew it. I knew it. This is about offering buckets. I knew it. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about offering buckets at all. I'll talk about that eventually. I'm not talking about that now. Uh, I'm talking about giving of yourself. It's a lost art in America, isn't it? It's wonderful when you're seven. Like, my, my kids, I get a Christmas gift every day right now. Every time I go home, they've got me something. Yesterday, it was a 1970s golf ball with the old Pepsi Cola logo on it. They found it in a closet. They wrapped it up in a Ziploc bag. And they brought it to me and said, Daddy, here's your Christmas present. Okay, they know I play golf. They know I drink Pepsi. That's an awesome gift. You know, that's what I'm saying. And, and, and tomorrow it will probably be, a, you know, a Hot Wheel car with a broken wheel or something like that, one they don't want to play with anymore, so they'll think Daddy will play with it. You know, that's what I'm talking about. We give of ourselves. You know, my, my favorite kid's gift, as long as whatever gift they're giving me comes with the minute and a half hug, I'm, I'm cool with it, you know? I, I'm telling you this to say this. What if we found ways to give more? Now, this takes a lot. This takes creativity. You have to think about this. You have to sit down and go, okay, what is a way that I can show my love to that person who I want to gift something to? And, and maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's a relational gift. Maybe I can find a way to give something relationally. We gave out last week a couple of ideas and a handout that you received. Uh, you can get another one of those if you'd like one. You can email or uh, find out. We may even just hand them out again next week. Uh, but some ideas that, that I would suggest, maybe you've got, you're a couple and you've got another couple and you want to buy the other couple a Christmas present. What if it was their favorite DVD that you rent and taped to it were two microwavable popcorn packets and the gift was, we're going to give it to you and then you're going to bring it to our house and we're going to watch a movie together. That's our Christmas with each other. See what I'm saying? That, that you just spent eight bucks or maybe five bucks, or if you go to the right movie store, you know, go to the red box, it's a buck, you know, and, and you just bless them, and you spent time together, and you enjoyed it. Uh, maybe, what if you bought them a board game that they mentioned liking when they were a kid, go get Clue, you know, you show up at their house, you sit down, you play Clue for a couple of hours, that's your Christmas together. It's time, it's investment, it's love, uh, you see what I'm saying? What if you made them the best, the best hot chocolate ever? And like, I'm talking go totally calorie nuts with it, melting Hershey in the hot chocolate, you know, like good stuff and take it to them as a, that's the kind of, I'm just saying, think about it. 
honestly, it's not that hokey. What if we actually made things for people? Now you're thinking, now Brad, we're not going to make things for that's hokey. Okay, some of you would make hokey things. I admit, I would probably make hokey things at times. So we'll stay away from the hokey. Some of you are like, if I made bracelets for all my girlfriends and gave all my girlfriends, I'm talking about a woman here, <laughs> for all my girlfriends, and I gave all of them little bracelets with beads that I made with fishing, wire, fishing line and stuff, they would think that's hokey. And I'm telling you, if the bracelet was hokey, they would think it's hokey, but make, make one that looks cool, you know? Think about it. Spend some time at the, at the, what is the thing at the mall? The Hobby Lobby. Michaels. Yes. They, they know how to make things that aren't hokey. You can come up with great ideas. And, and just so you know, I'm not saying that giving more of yourself will cost nothing. I'm not saying that it won't cost you anything. In fact, some gifts that are very relational might actually cost a lot. Uh, you might find that in some people with you in your life, to give them something relational actually means to spend more. It might, it might be impossible to do what you really think you should do and not spend any or not spend much. But this is giving of yourself. Here's the example from Scripture. We talk about giving gifts because people gave gifts to Jesus, right? That's great. That's biblical. That's good. Nothing wrong with that. But what if for this year, what if we used Jesus as the example? You see, he did not give gifts to people. He gave himself as a gift. There's a difference. There's a difference. I can put a bow on anything and give it to you. It's a lot harder, and it takes a lot more for me to give you a piece of me, to give you something of my time, of my effort, of my focus, to, for you to know that you got some of my concentration. Well, what a good gift. In America, the average dad spends seven to eight minutes a day alone with their child. Seven to eight minutes a day is the average. What if your Christmas gift, or one of a few, was half a day, me and you, whatever you want to do, that's what we're going to do today. See what I'm saying? I'm, I guarantee you, I guarantee you a lot of our kids would like it more. Okay? And again, it might not be instead of, it might be instead of 11 gifts, how about if it's eight gifts and a half a day with daddy? See what I'm saying? Just that kind of thing. So to summarize here, you guys, we're going to worship fully. We're going to consider, I'm asking you to consider in your home spending less. I'm asking you to give more in giving of yourself. And the last thing, which we'll cover more later, is I'm asking you to love all. Americans, we spend 450 to 500, this is the big word here, billion dollars on Christmas. That's the commerce expense for Christmas in America. From, from Black Friday until Christmas Day, we spend $450 billion. To give clean water to every person on the planet, estimates are somewhere between, between $10 and $12 billion. Okay, do you see how the difference there? 50 or 500 billion? 10 billion. So I'm asking you to help me and for us together to love all. We're going to take, if you're willing to do this, we're going to take some of that money that you didn't spend. I'm not asking for all of it. I'm not asking for a huge amount of it, but some of it. Some of the money that you don't spend overspending, we're going to take some of it and we're going to find a way to bless those who are in need. We're going to find a way to give to someone in a way that's more important than a wrapped package. We're going to give them something that without it they can't live or without it they can't live spiritually. We're working together a plan to be able to, to uh, help fund the digging of a well in a country that needs one. We're looking to help fund planting of churches in communities that need them. And we're looking at helping feed the stomachs of the poor in places where they are hungry. Okay? Those are things that we're looking to do. We're going to give a percentage of our offerings uh, the last two Sundays of the year uh, to that. And the more we give here, the more we get to give away to those things. Okay? Does that make sense? You guys, I don't know if this is exciting to you or not. It's exciting to me. Blake's Campus, I hope it's exciting to you. For us as a church to have a special and beautiful Christmas experience as we worship fully, spend less, give more, and love everyone. Would you pray with me?